to do working capital management today. Uh, allow me then to share my screen and get things started. Working capital management. Have plenty of plenty of open uh, plenty of open documents here. If I can close them to make my workspace to make my workspace lean. Let me close this. Okay. All right. You want to discuss working capital management. Oh, well, right, working capital management. You, 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 <clears throat> what's your understanding of working capital must? Um, I think working capital consists of our non, our current assets and current liabilities. Okay. Current assets and current liabilities. That's working capital. So, by definition, you know, don't write. You only write when I feel like you need to write. Working okay. capital means money or resources required for day-to-day -day running of the business. That's working capital. Money or resources required for day-to-day -day running of a business. When we look at working capital, actually, we are looking at current assets and current liabilities because these, they have an element of day-to-day -day running of the business. Now, two main objectives in working capital management, which we can refer as, oh, Amaz, you can mute, I mean, I'm getting some, some. Okay. You know, the two main objectives of, uh, of working capital management is profitability and liquidity. Get that right. We manage working capital to ensure that as the firm is trying to be profitable, it is not achieving profitability at the expense of the business ability to operate as a going concern. So that is self-explanatory. Profitability and liquidity are twin or two main objectives of working capital management. As we, in our quest to be profitable, let us do it in such a manner that we are not compromising profitability of the business. All right. So there are key, I mean, the key main aspects of working capital management. Uh, we do have what is called working capital investment and working capital financing. Right. <clears throat> we do have the, the key aspects of working capital management. Remember, I have said objectives. I have said objectives of working capital management. It's liquidity, liquidity and profitability. Profitability. These are the two main objectives of working capital management. Another thing, another thing is we, we, we manage working capital to ensure that um, minimize the risk of over trading. That's another objective. Minimize the risk, the risk of over trading. 
management of working capital, we must ensure that we don't overtrade. And you may ask and say, say, what, what is overtrading? A situation, overtrading is also known as undercapitalization. Undercapitalization. A situation where the business grows, the business grows too fast without a commensurate investment in working capital. You are, as a business, you are growing too fast so that your, your working capital is not able to keep pace with the volume of your growth. You are said to be overtrading. So what are the symptoms of overtrading? Symptoms of overtrading. How do we tell that the business is overtrading? Symptoms symptoms of overtrading. Because if, 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 you, if you realize any of these symptoms, you know, when, when we say symptoms, we are not saying you are actually overtrading, but we are saying chances are you are at the risk of overtrading. It's like if you have got symptoms of COVID, it does not mean you have got COVID. It means you are at the risk of having COVID. So go and get tested. So the same way, if a business is experiencing symptoms of overtrading, it doesn't mean necessarily that it is overtrading, but it is at the risk of overtrading. So it might be overtrading, actually. Like taking longer, taking longer to collect money from customers. Collect money from trade receivables. Right? That's one. When your trade receivable both days are getting longer, two longer inventory holding periods, longer inventory holding period, longer inventory holding period. It's a sign of overtrading, and then longer payables payment period, longer payables payment period. When you realize that you do have pay, uh, issues with payables, you know, when creditors are calling you, you are switching off the phone. You used to pay them in two months. They are now taking quite a, a long period without paying. When you have that, that the chances are you might be over trading. You might be over trading. These are symptoms. And then it's Longer cash operating cycles. Longer cash operating cycles. What is a cash operating cycle? It's COC. COC, cash operating cycle. If you ever heard of it, uh, Yeah, I've read something of a sort about a cash operating cycle. Uh, it consists of the yes. number of days um, of the inventory days, the trade received with days against the days we take when paying our creditors. Yes. Cash operating cycle means the number of days that it takes from the from the time we order inventory up to the time time we receive cash from customers for goods sold. That's cash operating cycle. How long it takes from the day we order inventory up to the time, you know, period, period from debt, cash is invested in inventory, period from the date, cash is invested in inventory, is invested in inventory until it is received from customers. From customers. That's this operating cycle. The period that it takes from the day you receive a, you, in, you 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 order stock or invest caches in inventory up to the time you receive such cash from customers. So cash operating cycle really is calculated as follows. Cash operating cycle is calculated as follows. So it is calculated as COC is calculated as follows.
follows. Calculate COC. So what I what I'm going to do it, it it would make sense if I say if if I just if if I say item here the formula let's say uh, days though it can be months. If it's months, you'll be multiplying, you will not be multiplying by over 365, but over 12. So you 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 what when you are calculating COC, you say raw material turnover period. Raw material turnover period. Turnover period. You know, you say turnover period, it's like how long is it taking for you to convert raw materials into something? You say raw materials over raw materials over cost of goods produced. Cost of goods. Ah, cost of raw materials consumed. Cost of raw materials consumed. Consumed. Right? Times 365. Let's say times 365 for now. Because it's in days. Though, you can actually have the answer in months. Raw materials over cost of raw materials consumed times 365. And then you have whip turnover period. Whip means a work in progress. Turn over period. Say whip over whip over cost of goods produced cost of goods, cost of goods produced. You know when we are saying produced, we are saying manufactured times three sixty five. You get your answer there. Then we have got finished goods turnover period. Finished goods turn off a period. Turn off a period. When you are calculating finished goods turn off a period, you simply say finished goods over cost of sales. Cost of sales times three sixty five. Well, actually, when actually the issues you are calculating cash operating cycle so you'll be you'll be adding this let me put a plus sign a plus a plus sign like this you'll be adding this plus and then you have receivables ten of a period period or receivables collection period so you add this receivables collection period you simply say receivables over credit sales receivables over credit sales times 365 if it was in months, you say times 12 months, then you say less, less, remember you are calculating cash operating cycle, less payables turn off a period, payables turn off a period. To say turn off a period is to say payment period. How long are payables lasting in your books? To say payables, cost of sales cost of sales times 365 so you subtract this the answer you get is called cash operating cycle cash operating cycle
So that's how you calculate it. Cash operating cycle. So you can say, say it appears cash operating cycle assumes a business which is into manufacturing. No. Even a service industry. You can calculate cash operating cycle for a firm of lawyers. Lawyers don't have raw materials, they don't have whip, they don't have finished goods. So cash operating cycle for lawyers, it's simply receivable collection period, less payables, turnover period. You just consider relevant. This is just a template for, for cash operating cycle. But if a business which manufactures furniture, for example, you say, how long did it take for us to have raw materials? Because cash is out. So you have raw materials turnover period. Plus, these raw materials are now being uh, converted into finished goods by production. So whip turnover period. Then you say work in progress over cost of goods produced. You have your answer. Then after the furniture is produced, it is stored in the showroom and stuff. How long are we taking with finished goods? You add. And after we have sold, how long are customers taking to pay? You add. Then you less what the period you are also getting from receivables, from payables. So now, you know, COC can be negative. COC can be negative. If COC is negative, it means FEM is negative. FEM collecting firm is collecting cash from receivables before cash from receivables before paying customers before paying suppliers or positive or positive coc can also be positive positive implying the opposite Positive implies the opposite. If COC, if COC is positive, it means you are paying suppliers first before collecting cash from customers. That's a positive COC. It means your supplier's payment period is shorter than your receivable's payment period. You get it? Ordinarily, the shorter the COC, the more effective the firm is working capital. The shorter the COC, the more effective, the more effective the firm is managing its working capital. It's managing its working capital. So we would want a COC to be shorter so that we will know if you are managing our working capital well. So it's so important that you get this. Now, the key aspects in working capital management. Key aspects in working capital management. Key aspects in working capital management. If you are managing working capital, what are you really doing? It's a very good question. When you are managing working capital, you are looking at these things. You are deciding issues like working capital investment, Working capital, working capital investment, that's what you are looking at. You are also looking at working capital financing, capital financing. You are also looking at management of cash, management of cash. We are also looking at management of receivables. Management. Management of receivables. Right? And even management of payables. Management of payables. All payables, you don't manage them 
mostly because they are the ones who dictate terms, but other variables are within your control. So if you are talking of working capital investment, working capital investment is the first thing. Working capital investment, we are saying, how much should we invest in working capital? How much, the level of money invested in working capital is what we mean by working capital investment. How much we should invest in working capital. And it is affected by quite a lot of things, working capital investment. Factors to consider. Factors to consider. If you want to know how much you should invest in working capital, factors to consider. No, oh, actually, let me write it underneath and say factors to consider to consider in deciding level of working capital in deciding the level of investment in working capital factors to consider in deciding the level of investment in working capital there are quite a lot of factors that we consider you know, by working capital, we are saying the, the resources we, we put aside for day-to-day -to -day running of a business. You know, they, they differ from one business to another. And they are, they are affected by nature of business. Oh, that's factor number one, nature. Nature of business. By nature of business, we are looking at things like, suppose you... You are comparing OK Supermarket and a firm of lawyers. You'd notice that OK Supermarket orders its inventory almost on a daily basis. But lawyers have very little inventory, so lawyers can make can go by and sustain themselves with minimum cash, with minimum investment in working capital, unlike a supermarket chain. Two, its business cycle. Business cycle. You know, business goes through periods of peak and down periods. You may say the business is at its peak, business is down. So in these inter, in, uh, intervals, the, the, there will be a resultant increase or decrease in money or resources needed for day-to-day -day running of the business in working capital, so to speak. Three, availability of credit. Credit. This is also a factor which affects how much you put aside this working capital. You know, if I know that I can get credit, I can get credit, I can get goods on credit, I may not keep inventory because I know that whenever customers approach me, I can order on credit. But if there is no in their credit facilities and stuff, I may find it difficult to, to get the goods. You get it? Another is number four, cash operating cycle. Cash operating cycle. It also affects the investment in working capital. It's like if you know that you are going to get your money quickly from customers, you may you may actually not suppose you are selling something and you know that your customers will pay you next week. You may use the money you have. In other words, you may have little working capital. You may opt to have little working capital. But if you realize that the, the customers are going to pay you in 60 to 90 days, you will actually hold on to the money you have. In other words, the level of working capital, even if, if it means you order inventory, you order more of it because you know that they will take long customers to repay you. That's working capital investment. Also, we look at working capital financing. financing policies uh, you know what it's one thing to decide how much you must invest in working capital but it's another to to know how is that investment going to be financed in other words where are you going to get the money you need to, to, to consider this as a key aspect in your working capital management where are you going to get the money now, now three main uh, 
Be, uh, before I talk about working capital invest financing, you need to understand that when it comes to current assets of a business, there are certain current assets which is which are known as permanent current assets. Like as, like suppose you are a supermarket, there there are there's a certain level of goods that you know that this rarely change. This is my stable level of inventory. But due to business volumes, like it's now festive season or it's now holidays, there might be some increase or uh, there might be some increase or decrease in the goods that you keep due to that changes in business level. We call that fluctuating current assets. So current assets are either permanent, those, this, those which are normally held at stable level, and fluctuating current assets which change from time to time due to, due to, uh, due to business for volumes. We call that fluctuating. So when you are financing working capital, you need to know which aspect really are you financing, the permanent current assets ones or the fluctuating current assets ones. So we do have what is called conservative approach conservative approach when you are conser you want to, you don't want to take risk conservative or risk averse approach risk averse approach so conser conservative or risk averse approach this is when the firm uh, the firm finances both permanent and fluctuating current assets from long-term sources. Permanent and fluctuating current assets. Fluctuating current assets from, from long-term sources. You use it as like long-term loans to finance both permanent or fluctuating current assets. That's a conservative approach. It's a less risk approach because long-term finance means it has to be repaid over a long period of time. So it doesn't put pressure should those goods fail to be bought. You are, you are not pressured because you don't have short term to pay it. Then the opposite is called the aggressive approach. Aggressive approach to working capital financing. You know, when we are talking of aggressive approach, what we are simply doing here is the firm finance, this is a risk seeking approach. It's a risk seeking, but profitable approach. You know, when, 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 when you seek risk, you also profit. Now, long term sources are expensive than short term sources. Short term sources are cheaper. You can't compare. You can't compare the cost of getting a loan from a bank and the cost of just getting goods on credit. That's cheaper. So, so aggressive approach is when both it's when both permanent and fluctuating current assets and fluctuating current assets, assets are financed from short-term sources, are financed from short-term sources. That's that aggressive approach. Now there's number three, which is called matching approach. Matching, as the name suggests, you are now matching permanent, you are saying permanent from long-term sources and and current from short-term sources, permanent approach, Ma I mean matching approach. Matching is when permanent current assets, permanent, permanent current assets are financed from, from long-term sources long term sources and and fluctuating ones from short term sources 
fluctuating ones from short term sources you know that's that's matching so this is the key aspect also in working capital management it's called working capital financing policies where do you get the money as you can see this has got a bearing on the firm's profitability you use conservative approach though it's less risky but it's costly aggressive approach is risky because you are using short-term sources which needs to be repaid quickly so you are taking risks but they are very cheap so they increase profitability matching you are saying permanent current assets from long-term sources and fluctuating current assets from short-term sources that's matching you get that and then we do have management of cash management of cash so one of the one of the key aspects in, in working capital management management of cash you get that you know why why cash cash needs to be managed because cash is an asset you need to understand that cash cash like any other asset any other asset need to be managed well the key thing you know cash management is cash effective cash management management the chances of no, you, you will use the chances of, let me put in a semicolon, there are chances that you will reduce, like chances of one, cash out costs. You know, a situation where you, you don't have cash out costs, like if you don't have cash out costs, you may result in over trading, meaning failing to pay suppliers, a lot of you put strain on your business uh, failure to service orders failure to save to service orders loss of customer loyalty loss of or, uh, or customers you lose customers you know that if you if you don't have cash in a business you lose customers or you may even fail to exploit a sudden opportunity failure to exploit a sudden opportunity there might be a sudden opportunity which if you have got cash you can exploit it but if you have got cash out costs that opportunity will go begging the opportunity will go begging because you are failing to manage cash and then we, 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 we also have what is called uh, there's cash out costs and cash holding costs. Cash holding costs like lost interest income, lost investment income. If you hold a lot of cash, you lose also investment income because holding cash is not investing it you know there are people who think that putting money in a bank with account which is not paying interest you have managed the cash you know cash which is in a bank account which is not paying any interest is not different from cash in the safe or in your pocket still we are holding it but it's idle so you know when you put it in the bank which is not paying interest you are simply putting it for safekeeping you are not managing it like theft cash out costs may include theft i mean cash holding costs may actually include theft etc so you need to to manage costs to i mean to manage effectively the cash that you have 
And you know, so you may say, say, what are the legitimate reasons for holding cash? When we say these are cash holding costs, you know, legitimate reasons for holding cash include legitimate reasons for holding cash include legitimate reasons for holding cash. There are quite you, there are various reasons, but these are the common ones. A you hold cash for transaction for 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 business trans for transaction purposes. Let's say transaction purposes. It is called transaction demand for money. You know, as business, we need cash for day-to-day -day transactions like stationary, you know what like the reasons why you hold petty cash. Those are those, it's, it's a legitimate reason for holding cash. B, you hold the cash for precautionary purposes. Precautionary demand for money. You know, by precaution, you are saying you are you are you are, you are holding money for just in cases, just in case or emergencies. They're all demanding to cater for unforeseen emergencies. What might be emergencies in business, like a sudden opportunity? A sudden opportunity, which need to be exploited, and you need to have cash at that, from, at that moment. We also had a world cash for speculative purposes. Speculative purposes. You know, like the, the recent past, in Zimbabwe, where people were keeping cash to for resale at exorbitant exchange rates or at exorbitant interest rates. That was merely speculation. It was one of the reasons for holding cash to speculate. You get that? So you can say, ah, so speculation is it bad? No, it's good at times, provided it's, 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 it's ethically being done with business rationale in mind. Like banks, banks do, they do speculate all the time, but we don't say they are doing it wrongly because that's the professional nature of running businesses. And like ma illegal money changers or parallel markets for currencies, those they destroy economies. Now, we are still on management of cash. Let us look at cash management models. Cash management models. They have meaning approaches to management of cash. There is what is called, there is what is called Baumol model. Baumol model, that's number one. Let me say number one, Baumol model. Baumol model. So, how does the Baumol model really works? The Baumol model is similar to, you know, it's similar to, to EOQ. It's similar to economic order quantity model, EOQ model of inventory management. Inventory. It's similar to economic order quantity model of inventory management. You know, it, 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 it assumptions, it assumes, it assumes a constant cash disbursement per annum, a fixed cash disbursement per annum, cash disbursement, meaning how you disburse cash is assumed to be constant per annum. Like economic order quantity model, remember, economic order quantity model, remember, it assumes that inventory is constant per annum. This one assumes that how you utilize cash is constant per annum. That's another thing. Cash is held, that another thing is cash is, I mean, let's say monetary resources are held either as cash or marketable securities. Monetary resources are 
held either as cash or marketable securities or securities so that's that's another thing it, it assumes that the cash is when you have got cash it's either you have got actual cash or you have invested it in marketable securities like treasure bills like treasure bills etc that's what that's what it assumes the cash that you have you are either holding it as cash or you have bought marketable securities so it, it says whenever you no longer need cash you buy marketable securities and when you need cash you sell marketable securities. You get that? The firm sells marketable securities in order to raise cash. That's another feature there. The firm sells marketable securities in order to raise cash. Securities in order to raise cash. When you need cash, you sell marketable securities. When you have plenty of cash, you buy marketable securities. So the model fixes the amount of marketable securities, which the model then fixes. The Baumol model. The model then fixes the amount of marketable securities. The amount of marketable securities. securities uh, the firm should sell the firm should sell which which yeah. yes I can no longer see what you are typing oh it's it's but you were seeing it shortly yes oh so it's in it's it's in it will be a data issue uh so it is still fine you can you can you can follow me. you were you were writing right yes so you can write as i'm saying it no problem okay so i'm saying the model then fixes the amount of marketable securities the firm should sell the firm should sell which minimizes Transaction cost of raising cash. Transaction cost of raising cash. Transaction cost of raising cash and you know the mark the amount of marketable securities which minimizes transaction cost of raising cash and opportunity cost of holding cash. Opportunity cost of holding cash. We call this we call this trading opportunity. It is called trading opportunity. Right? Right. So so transaction costs are assumed to be fixed, you know. The, it's like economic order quantity which says order cost is assumed to be fixed. Now, for you to understand, if you are seeing the screen, you let me know if it's if it's back. Okay. Now, for you to understand um, the Baumol model, it is, I'm sure it is important if I can, right? How about now? Are you seeing my screen now? Are you seeing it? No yet. No yet. It's just a blank. Um, no, it's not black, but 
I last saw whatever you were typing when you were writing about management of cash. Not not about Baumol model. Yes, there's nothing about the Baumol model. Alright. Oh, well, let me unshare the screen and reshare it and see how it goes. <clears throat> Okay, how about now? Are, are you seeing it? Not yet. Yes, I can see that. Okay, because what I want to show you requires the skilling to be there. Yeah. Now, no. uh, what I want, what I want us to do is. I, I want to use Baumol model to, I want to use economic order quantity model to explain the Baumol model. Because most students, you know EOQ model. And EOQ model is, this, is, is similar to what we are referring here as Baumol model. These are similar really. Only that EOQ is for inventory management, Baumol model is for cash management. So EOQ model says you order, you place an order which minimizes both ordering costs and stock holding costs. And that order is called economic order quantity. You still remember the formula? It's square root of, remember you put square root as, as the square root sign. Here, because I'm on Excel, I simply say SQRT. It's a square root of two times annual demand. You remember? Times cost of placing an order, CO. All this over CHO, holding cost, close bracket. That economic order quantity. It's a square root of this. Now, according to EOQ, we were also taught that total ordering costs are calculated like this. Total ordering costs, total ordering costs are calculated like total ordering costs, which I can say TOC. TOC, that's total ordering costs. They are calculated as, you say TOC equals, TOC equals, you say D over EOQ times cost per order. Cost per order. This is how you calculate total ordering cost. D over EOQ multiplied by cost per order. And we were also told to calculate total holding costs. Because you, you shall see EOQ in the exam. You need to remember this formula. Total holding cost, which is T, THC. So THC, THC equals, uh, it was like, Like you say buffer if there is buffer inventory buffer plus EOQ over two. You still remember buffer is like surface stock. That is stock we keep buffer plus EOQ over two times CH cost pay of holding one unit. So this is this is economic order, economic order quantity model, and then it says total cost, total cost, which is TC equals total ordering cost plus total holding cost. Right. Now let us see Baumol model on a comparative approach. Using what you already know, 
which is EOQ. The Baumol model says, you know, for EOQ, you are ordering stock. When it comes to money, we don't say you are ordering money. No, no, no. But we say you are raising money. So still, EOQ, a Baumol model like this, we have written a statement which we said, the model then fixes, you know, this statement is important. The model then fixes the amount of marketable securities the firm should sell, which minimizes transaction cost of raising cash and the opportunity cost of holding cash. You know, with EOQ, you are minimizing ordering costs and holding costs. With it, when it comes to money, we call them transaction costs. So you say cash raised. Cash raised. You don't say EOQ now. Cash raised equals. You again say square root. Open bracket. Two. Times annual cash disbursement. ACD. Times transaction cost. Uh, let's say transaction section cost all this over interest rate per annum interest rate per annum so you put it as a decimal the interest rate is is, is put as a decimal that's you know acd means annual cash disbursement where where acd ACD equals annual cash disbursement. Annual cash disbursement. That's ACD, annual cash disbursement. So you then say total transaction cost. We don't say ordering when it comes to money, we say transaction. Total transaction cost in brackets TTC total transaction cost how do you calculate it now you say TTC equals TTC equals if the like EOQ EOQ we say the D of D over EOQ on on Baumol model we simply say annual cash disbursement over cash raised cash raised times cost per transaction cost per transaction you know you are done then total holding cost which we call trading opportunity total this is called trading opportunity it's like total holding costs trading opportunity the cost of holding money you simply say to equals you say cash raised cash raised over two times interest rate so it is important to make sure that if you are told that the company uses cash of 12 million per month, you multiply that by 12 months to make it annual cash disbursement because the interest you'll be given, it will be per annum. You get that? Then total cost, total cost, TC equals Total transaction cost plus trading opportunity. So you're done. Uh, so if, if for EOQ, if there's no buffer inventory, here where we say the holding cost buffer plus EOQ over two, you just say EOQ over two. Remember, only EOQ is divided by two. Buffer is not divided by two. In this formula. It's buffer plus EOQ over 2. So EOQ is the 1 divided by 2, not the buffer. So if there's no buffer or surface inventory, you just say 0 plus or just ignore. Just say EOQ over 2. 
So you have that, you have this. This is Baumol model. It's an approach to cash management. We shall do this when you are doing questions. That's Baumol model. And then we also have what is called Miller O model. Miller O Miller O model. Uh, now you do notice Baumol model is a fixed model. It's, it's a static model. It's a static model in what way? It assumes that the amount of cash you use, the amount of cash you use on a, on a per annum never changes. But you know, business needs for cash change from time to time. Even, even a person's needs for cash change from time to time. You know that as a person, the cash you need on Monday is different from the cash you need on, 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 on Friday. As for me, for example, the cash I need on Monday is different from the cash I need on Saturday. So I need a model for cash management which reflects that. These static models, they think you have got, they assume you have got use, even usage of cash, which does not change. So Miller O model is practical. It's like how you use, how you stock up cooking oil at home. You know, cooking oil, you, you, have, you, you, you have got an upper limit of cooking oil and a lower limit of cooking oil. You don't buy cooking oil, um, you don't buy cooking oil like, Stable, a stable quantity of cooking oil always normally. We have got an upper limit and a lower limit. So most in most instances, there's need to have an upper limit and a lower limit and allow cash to fluctuate within the limit set. So it's like this. The model, the model is, I mean, this is more variable compared to Baumol model. This is more variable compared to Baumol model, compared to Baumol model, you get that? It sets, you know, it sets the upper and lower limit of cash, the upper and lower limit of cash that the firm should hold. Lower and upper limit of cash that the firm should hold. That's the Baumol model, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the Miller O model. It sets the upper and lower limit of cash that the firm should hold and allow cash levels and allow, allow cash level to fluctuate within the limit set, fluctuate within the limit set. So this one is, 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 is pretty cool that way. It allows cash level to fluctuate within the limit set, right? So, so write this, when cash, when cash, Ah, let me say, the firm also, the firm also sets the return point, also sets the return point, the return point of cash, which helps it, which helps it to decide, to decide the amount, the amount of marketable securities to be bought or sold, marketable securities to be bought or sold in order to bring the cash within the limit set, order to bring cash level within the limit set to bring 
refresh level in the limits set. So that one is so important. You 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 it sets what is called the return point. It's a point where the firm ought to use is to decide how much cash how much cash to use to buy marketable securities or marketable securities to sell to bring cash within the limit set. Now, notice this important point. With Miller O model, it is similar to Baumol model in the sense that cash is held either, either as cash or marketable securities. So if a firm has got plenty of cash, like cash has reached its upper limit, the, what the firm does is it buys marketable securities so that it reduces cash. If the cash is about to reach, to reach the lower limit, it sells marketable securities to raise cash. So it will be like this. It will be like this. If cash... So, so let me say NB1 If cash reaches the upper limit, if cash reaches the upper limit, upper limit, comma, the firm, you know, you know, there is what is called the return point. It's like if you are a stores controller, you have what is called the reorder level. You don't wait until something is, 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 is you have exhausted inventory before you reorder. There is what is called a reorder level. You need to understand that. So even for cash, you don't wait for cash to exhaust the cash you have before you, 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 you raise another other cash. So the point where you decide that is called the return point. The analog is similar but not exact. It's similar to say reorder, but we call it a return point. So if, if for example, cash reaches the upper limit, if the cash reaches the upper limit, it means you now have a lot of cash. So you need to reduce it. You reduce it by buying. You know, you reduce cash by buying. You can't say, I want to reduce cash by selling. If you are selling, are you reducing cash or you are raising it? So what you do is, if cash reaches the upper limit, the firm buys in caps. The firm buys marketable securities with marketable securities with with upper limit minus return point minus return point these are securities by when cash reaches the upper limit you buy marketable securities with upper limit minus the return point. And another thing is, if cash reaches the lower limit, now if, if cash reaches the lower limit, it means you, you now have to sell marketable securities to raise cash, to bring it within the limit. Always cash should not exceed upper limit or fall below the lower limit. So if it reaches upper limit, you buy to, to reduce cash to the return point. If it, if it reaches the lower limit, you sell to raise cash to the return point. So it will be like if cash reaches the upper limit, if cash reaches limit comma the firm the firm sells this time marketable securities with marketable security with the firm sells marketable securities with Return point minus lower limit. Return point minus lower limit.
or limit like this. this way, that's how the firm regulates its cash. Now you may say, say, how do we fix these limits? Write this. The limits are fixed using the following formula. Limits are fixed using the following following formula. Means how we fix. There are various formula you use to fix these limits, like upper limit. Upper limit. Upper limit. You say upper limit. You say equals lower limit plus spread. Upper limit equals lower limit plus spread. That's how you fix the upper limit. So I shall show you how the spread is calculated. And then return point. Return point. Return point of cash. You get it by saying lower limit. Lower limit plus one third of spread lower limit plus one third of spread that's the return point of cash and then we have lower limit lower limit lower limit, lower limit is usually given usually it, it is usually given given as minimum cash balance minimum cash balance and then and then uh, spread is calculated as follows spread equals now let me open a question paper just to show you how the spread is calculated <clears throat> So here is how you calculate spread. The formula is available from the table formula here. If you can copy that formula for spread. Can you copy that, the formula for spread? Three times ETC, ETC. Are you done copying? Yes. Okay. So that's the formula for spread. So you can see here that uh, so spread. So we have we have it we have copied it. We have copied it. Now, are you not seeing here that if you look closely, there's another formula for spread. You know, you can simply say spread equals. You can say O, O, spread equals upper limit minus lower limit. There was an exam where the examiner gave upper limit 
and lower limits, and there was nothing like daily interest rate variance of cash flows. And the students said, you say there was there were no figures to calculate spread. I want you to pay attention. If if upper limit is lower limit plus spread, like upper limit, you get it by saying lower limit plus spread. It means if you say upper limit minus lower limit, you get spread. So in that equation, examiner gave the upper limit and the lower limit. The examiner did not give all the figures to calculate spread using this formula, like interest rates, like transaction. All this information was not there. And already the examiner was saying, determine the, market, the amount of marketable securities to be bought or sold. And the student will say, oh, how then do I calculate spread? You get it. So on this one, allow me to give you an illustration. I want you to work it out. A, a quick illustration. Just to, to see to it that you are able to, to work stuff. Let's, let me say lower limit. I'm just getting figures. Lower limit, let's say it's 25,000. That's lower limit of cash. Then variance. Variance of cash flows. Variance of, let's say, daily cash flows. Variance of daily cash flows. Let's say it's 40 million. And then let's say transaction cost. Transaction cost. Transaction cost is twenty dollars. Daily interest rate. Daily interest rate. Interest rate. Daily interest rate is 0.4%. You know, the interest rate is the formula for spread. This interest rate here, yeah. it's not per annum, but it's per day. So if you are given interest rate as 12% per annum, you don't put 12 here under interest rate. You divide 12 by 365 to get daily interest rate. So important. So it's daily interest rate. So it's 0.4% or if you are putting it, you put it as decimal, 0.004. Now, the requirements are required. Required. One. Calculate. Calculate spread, spread, comma, upper limit, upper limit, and return point of cash, return point of cash. Two, Calculate marketable securities to be sold when cash reaches the upper limit. Calculate marketable securities bought or sold to be bought or sold to correct cash position. Cash position. Now, because I want to give you solution, but I, I'll give you solution in vague terms so that you prove whether you are getting these figures right. Solution, I'm putting solution just across. Spread, I, I won't give you full figures. The spread should come out as dollar sign. It should be 15 with some three digits to the nearest whole number. 
upper limit upper limit is 40 with some three digits i want you to work it out return point return point it should be 30 with some three digits and then marketable securities to be bought remember marketable securities to be bought you say upper limit minus return point so it should be 10 it should be 10 with some three digits and marketable securities to be sold ms to be sold it will be five with some three digits i'm giving you five minutes to work this i want you now to tell me the correct the complete figures after working make sure you, you write the formula first in the notes for your notes to make sense i'll be back i'll be back around 28 or half past so I'm, I'm i'm going out shortly work it out
Pedir más. Tiene, pedir. Vai, está ahora nací. ¿Qué tal de figas? Jungo para más figas, sí. Ok, like, upper limit, spread, so much, so much, so much. All right. For oh, the spread, I got 15,940. Uh-huh. In the upper limit, I got 40,940. Mm -hmm. Return point, I got 30,313. Mm -hmm. Then the marketable securities to be bought, I got 10,627. Mm -hmm. Then to be sold, I got 5,313. Good. So that's what I wanted to just check. You know, you end max. For that and I, 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 you now anticipate that another way of calculating spread is just the same upper limit minus lower limit if you are given lower limit and upper limit so that's about yes. management of cash remember what we are discussing is key aspects in working capital management so we have listed them here 
once we are done with this, we are done with the topic. So we said working capital investment, we are done with it. Working capital financing, we are done with it. Management of cash, we are done with it. Let us now go to management of receivables. Management of receivables. You know? Management of receivables. Management of receivable is what is called credit control. You know, if 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 we are if you are working in the credit control department, you are actually managing receivables. So, what are the duties of a credit control manager, if we may ask? Like, duties of the credit control manager. I think, um, I think yes. the duties of the credit manager is to plan, monitor, and collect receivables. Right. The duties of a credit control manager, and and I like the way you know this. You know these things. You 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 need to know this. You, the duties of the credit control manager is basically to plan, monitor, and formulate receivables management policies. So they, they are they are like in this particular case, it's like they determine credit weightiness. I mean, evaluate, actually, evaluate credit worthiness, credit worthiness, worthiness of current and potential customers, current and potential customers, evaluate the credit worthiness of current and potential customers, that's duty number one of a credit control manager. Evaluate the credit worthiness of current and potential customers. So you have that. Uh, what, what are the factors that we consider when you're evaluating cre uh, credit worthiness? We check at things like capital, Say to, 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 to check what is the current capital, or oh, let, let, let me say factors to consider, factors to consider when you are evaluating credit worthiness of current and potential customers, these are the factors you consider. You consider things like, actually let me call them five C's for your remembrance. You you look at things like like uh, capital, meaning meaning what is the current capital of this particular customer? Is this is in this customer heavily in debt at the moment, so that if you are to extend additional debt, it, it, such a customer may fail to pay. You look at things like collateral. Customer have enough collateral. Collateral, collateral is important because collateral it mitigates the risk against customer default. You know, if a customer is to default, and we had attached some assets as collateral, the overall loss to us is mitigated. Then issues like cash flow projections. Why, if if you are if you want to get a bank loan, you would be asked to bring a cash a cash flow projection. They want to see your forecast cash flows and their ability to sustain the new credit. If we factor in credit, are they are able to pay credit and enable the firm to remain healthy? Another is condition of the business. Condition of business. You know, 
condition we are looking of nature of business nature of business you can't you it's not every business which can be given credit even some businesses may have collateral and stuff but nature of business and its ability to sustain credit so important then you will also look at character character of those charged with governance character of directors director this is like integrity and competence of those which are charged with governance. You know, by that I mean the directors themselves. Are they of such nature that they can utilize money well? No wonder why if you want to borrow a loan, you would be asked to have a brief profile, company profile of directors telling us who are the directors. What do they stand for? Their qualifications, etc. So there you go. That's duty number one of credit manage, control manager. Duty number two is setting credit limits of current and potential customers. Setting credit limits of current and potential customers. You may say, say, why are you saying current? Even if we have borrowed a customer, it does not mean the credit limit is permanent. No. It must be subject to review depending on how the customer is performing. So that if due to changes in circumstances, we may as well set a new credit limit. Another is updating the receivables ledger, or we call it receivables ledger management. Receivables ledger, receivables ledger management ledger management by receivables ledger management we are saying updating the ledger with it's with with updating updating customer records records updating customer records I be, sorry, I'm in a lecture. I will, I will revert. Don't worry, I will. Okay. Fine. Otherwise, how are you? Doing great. Updating customer records with voices, payments, credit notes, etc. You need to understand this. That's your one. That's one of your duties. Another is credit collection. Credit collection. You know, you don't necessarily do this like yourself. Remember, you work with clerks, with your juniors. That's the that's the that's the job of your clerks. But you have all you have responsibility in everything. Credit collection, like. Chasing outstanding payments. Chasing outstanding payments from customers. That's credit collection. Right? Five is, you know, credit collection involves even uh, issuing. Under credit collection, it also involves issuing reminders or statements of accounts. Issuing reminders or statements of accounts. That, that, that's credit collection. Another aspect under credit collection is writing off bad debts or granting discounts. Granting discounts, writing off bad debts, writing off bad debts, etc. You know, there's another unorthodox way like handing off a trouble some customers to come and lawyers or attorneys. When you realize that these guys can't pay, you can actually hand them over to come and attorneys or lawyers. You get that?
right then okay so there you go these are the duties of credit control manager you may amongst or even though all duties are important but the main duty which is outstanding if we make you a credit control manager if i'm your ceo is this element of credit collection i need to see how money is coming in which ma with the amount of money that we are owing that customers are owing and what customers are promising to pay us and what we have collected and those who are yet to pay what are their reasons this is what is of interest to me as a ceo i may not be interested in how as a credit control manager how you are managing your ledger and stuff ah, not really not really so so let us now take it up and say credit collection Remember, we are about to be done and we shall do some few questions and we wrap it up. Credit collection. Now, credit collection means you need to collect money from outstanding customers in terms of the current credit control policy that the firm has. So, credit control, credit collection. Now, the first discussion item is methods of financing credit collection. Methods of enhancing credit collection. Methods of enhancing credit collection. How do you make sure that you navigate through this thing of credit collection? First, well, let us dis discuss one by one in turn. Cash discounts. Cash discounts. Cash discount, if you if you may ask, it's an allowance given to credit customers to pay promptly. An allowance given, I mean granted. Let's list the term granted to credit customers. Credit customers to encourage them to pay promptly. To encourage them to pay promptly. Uh, are you seeing, Mazita, that I type fast? No, notice I'm always typing. Are you not seeing it? Yes, I noticed. No wonder why I, I, I wrote all those notes that I that we always send in groups. Uh, do you have the notes written, uh, FM notes by Mr. Mpati? Yes. Yes. All, the, all those notes, I typed them. Imagine, that's how, that's, that's how I like typing. If you check, you can see that it's, it's the same type of typing, the same way of typing. Yes, so it's right. like an allowance granted to credit customers to encourage them to pay promptly. That's a cash discount. And you know what? You know, e.g., there's various notations we use on a cash discount. We can have a discount which says 2 slash 10 30. This this is this is a notation. Two slash ten net thirty means it means a discount. A discount of two percent is granted on payments received. On payments received within ten days. Payment received within ten days. If not, the full amount will be paid up to the 30th day. If not, the full amount, not the full amount, will be paid up to the 30th day. Not, not all up to the third of the month, no, 30th day. You, If you don't pay within 10 days, you are no longer going to get a discount. So whether you pay on the 20th, on the 25th, through to the 30th day, there's no discount. So, 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 so if you have something like net 30, suppose you have something like net 30, it means there's no discount whatsoever. A credit term may just say net 30. So like this. 
it means there's no discount. A discount will be given, a discount offer, an invoice will be like this. That's what an invoice will look like. You get that? So, so under normal circumstances, for you to grant a discount, for the discount to make sense, you know, the decision to grant a discount will be worthwhile. The decision to grant a discount will be viable if allowed if the discount allowed the discount allowed which is the cost of discount cost of discount is lower is lower than the is lower than the savings for financing costs receivable financing costs right now uh, uh, what i want to what what i want you to notice is this when it comes to receivables there's a mindset which is required master a line of thinking which which is normal and which cause you to to have fun but if you don't stick to it you know, your life becomes miserable when it comes to receivables this is one thing if i sell goods to you on credit it does not mean i picked the, the goods from the ground and offered them to you no when I sell goods to you on credit, it means I got the money from somewhere, ordered the goods, and sell them to you on credit. But wherever I got the money, I still I am paying finance cost for that money. So if you take 30 days to pay me, it means I am taking 30 days to pay the person who gave me the money. Even if I'm using my own money. Remember, every money has got an opportunity cost. Every money has got a required rate of return. If, even if I'm using my own money to buy goods and sell them to you on credit, the bottom line is there's a cost to... If, if you are paying me after 30 days, I am being charged for 30 days. That's the bottom line. So if I then give you a discount and you pay me in 10 days, it means I have saved from where I am being charged because it's no longer 30, it's now 10 days. I am now being charged for 10 day receivables, not 30. So there's a saving that I make and then I compare the saving to the discount that I have allowed. If the discount is less than the saving that I make, then the discount is viable. That's the common sense there. No wonder why we are saying the discount should be lower than the savings in the receivable financing cost. We have got two receivables or debt factoring. Debt factoring. You know, selling off debts. So, you know, debt factoring means, uh, oh, tell your say, what do you understand by debt factoring? Um, I think debt factoring is when we we like have our data is being followed up by a factor company at an insurance premium. Maybe we've been paying an insurance to a certain debt factoring company, so they do the follow ups in our place. Yes. Yes, that's, the, that's generally what it is, but specifically it is like this. It, it involves obtaining finance, obtaining a refundable, refundable, we call it recourse, recourse, obtaining refundable or recourse or non-refundable 
non-refundable in brackets non-recourse non-recourse close bracket finance on the security of firms receivables on the security of firms receivables on the security of firms receivables that's debt factoring you are receiving finance with recourse or non recourse based on the firms receivables it's so important in other words you you approach a firm which offers factoring services and tell them that look i have got debtors who are to pay me or receivables who are to pay me in 90 days so you agreed with your debtors that they will pay you in 90 days but you you need money now so the factor will then say look if the money you need is is, is 80000 we can give you 75000 on that 80 or 78 in other words they've charged you 2000 if they give you 78 and the terms of the arrangement may be look if your customers fail to pay you have to refund us our money back or don't worry if your customers fail to pay you don't need to refund so if it's a non-recourse factor there's no more risk of bad debts to you but if it's a recourse factor you have to refund the money that you got so you still you still retain the risk of bad debts so the issue then becomes factors offer expertise on receivables management factor offers expertise on receivables management you know this is what a factor does also on receivables management a factor offers expertise on receivables management so important another is a the firm, I mean, with a non-recourse factor, with a non-recourse, non-refundable, that's what it means, but the language should be non-recourse factoring, non-recourse factoring, comma, the firm, the firm will no longer be exposed to the risk of bad debts, no longer be exposed to the risk of bad debts that's with a non-recourse factoring you are no longer exposed to the risk of bad debts you know it's with a recourse factoring the firm retains the risk of bad debts with a recourse factoring a firm The risk of bad debts. Another is a fettering may help the fettering fettering may result may result in savings. Factoring may result in saving in overheads associated with credit control. Overheads in administration, administration or credit control. You may save a lot of money because you are using expertise. So, 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 so there is a risk management element. There is you get money. You get money. So the main advantage of factoring is that you obtain refundable or non-refundable finance on the security of your receivables. That's the main advantage. Now, the factor charges a cost or a fee for these services. You know, factor charges a fee for these four for its services. So, decision criteria then becomes 
the decision criteria then is uh, the, the the factoring i mean factoring will be viable factoring will be viable if incremental costs incremental costs from factoring if incremental costs from factoring are less than incremental cost savings incremental cost savings so you need to 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 compare the incremental costs of factoring and the savings and if you save more than what it costs you then go for it if not leave it another it's credit terms adjustment to credit terms alteration of credit terms alteration of credit terms that's one way of that's another way of credit collection you can necessarily alter your credit terms you know, I wanted this to take us to five and we are at five o'clock sharp so that we do questions. Allow us to go to say quarter past and then we start doing questions. Alterations to credit terms. You know, when we are talking of alterations to credit terms, we are saying, uh, So, you know, this involves, this involves in, uh, extending or reducing credit period. Extending or reducing, you know, credit period. Credit period. That's what we mean by alteration. You are either extending credit period or you are reducing credit period. You get it. So, 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 what you simply do is. Oh, sorry. Let me not. You know, procedure. Procedure. Procedure is. Here is the procedure. Please, uh, 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 Marcy. Here is how you proceed. First step. First step, first step, uh, let me say, when, whenever there are changes to credit terms, like 60 days, we want to change to 45 days, or so forth, what you do is calculate receivables under the old policy. Calculate receivables, receivables under the old policy you calculate receivables under the old policy so you put xxx here and then step two oh second step second step calculate receivables under the new policy Calculate receivables under the new policy. Calculate the receivables under the new. So that one was old. Let me put it in, in bold, the word old and the word new. Under the old policy, calculate receivables. Under the new policy, calculate receivables. Then the answer you get here is known as increase or decrease in receivables. Or decrease in receivables. Simple stuff. To calculate whether there was an increase or whether there was a decrease, let's say increase 
or increase or decrease in receivables. Now, what you then do is notice, let me repeat what I said before now. I said containing receivables, this is an important line of thinking. It goes like this. Whenever you sell goods on credit, it means it does not mean you got the goods for free. No, no, no. It means you were financed and you got money to buy these goods and you are now giving them to a customer on credit, say for 60 days. Whilst the customer is yet to pay you, you are being charged. Either you got an overdraft or you have got any other cost of short-term financing. So the examiner will give you the cost. Say the, say, let's say the examiner says, let's say the examiner says, um, let's say old policy was, let me say old policy was, e.g. e.g. old policy, let's say was 60 days. 60 days. So what it means is, I would say 60, 60 over 365 times credit sales. Times credit sales. So this will be my receivables under old policy. Let's say my receivables under new policy is now 45 days, e.g. 45 days. So I will be saying 45 over 365 times credit, credit sales, right? Then I have the new, new receivables. So let's say these receivables, e.g., let me just say here, e.g., let's say these receivables were 820. The new receivables are six are six hundred. It means there will be decrease in credit receivables of two twenty. Now, I would then say. So 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 what what happens is, if a decrease, if a decrease, comma. The firm saves financing cost. The firm saves financing costs. If increase otherwise, otherwise, <clears throat> otherwise, if increase. So, <clears throat> if if I was giving you, if I was giving you thirty days. 60 days to pay me, it means I was being charged for 60 days. If it was 10%, it was 10% of 820. Now, if I grant you 45 days, it means I'm now being charged 10% of 600. So I have saved 10% of 220. So I then say, like this one, this one is a decrease. So in this case, this one is a decrease, as you can see. So because it's a decrease, I go by the statement written in red, which says, if it's a decrease, the firm saves on financing cost. So then I say, saving in financing cost, financing cost, saving in financing cost, I then say, ara percent, ara percent, multiply by, 220. You get that? So this will be a saving. Right? So this is the second step. That's what how you calculate saving. We don't we don't have this, so it will become a saving. Oh, sorry. I wrote it in the wrong color. So this is the saving. Now, if you if you then compare, uh, so so you the, there will be like other savings, other savings, other savings if 
credit days are reduced if credit days are reduced there are other savings if credit days are reduced like eg saving in bed debts saving in bed debts bed debts now saving in bed debts you add it and then you have saving in admin costs in admin costs you add them right then you say less less costs from reducing credit terms potential costs from reduction in credit terms potential costs from reduction in credit terms potential costs from reduction in credit terms there are costs associated with this eg eg contribution from i mean lost contribution from decreased sales lost contribution reduction in sales lost contribution from reduction in sales so you know if you if 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 there is if you reduce credit sales there might be lost contribution from reduction in sales there might also be discount allowed discount allowed these are some of the costs Then what you then do is uh, you 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 add these, and the answer that you get is net benefit or net cost. Net benefit slash net cost. Net benefit slash cost. So what you then do is accept if there's a benefit. Accept the proposed terms post terms if there is a net benefit if there's a net benefit you accept the proposed terms quite a lot of things that i can discuss concerning working capital management like management of payables but management of payables is also incidental to inventory management. So we have discussed already when we're doing a Baumol model and Miller O model. So this is the gist of it all. Allow us now to have some few questions. Ah, we need to have some few questions so that the notes will make sense. So allow me to you know the students of this class are amazing how on earth can students check that the lecture is being recorded and relax like this no it's not fair i would like students to join lectures you know out of nine who are supposed to be in this class just one it's not fair. Imagine if Masita has not joined. So I would I would have switched this lecture with Sima or something. Um, so there you go. I have sent the book there. If I can, I can open it here on working capital management. So it's opening on a page we were discussing last time. Right. Mm. 
plenty of questions on working capital management for you to, 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 to start from. From question number 41 on, on the BPP revision kit. So allow me to allow me to say illustrations. 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 We are getting them from BPP open brackets 2019 revision kit. Revision kit. It's from 219 to 2020. So 219 to 2020. 2020 revision kit. Question number 41. So let us do questions one after the other in 10 until our time clocks. The following information has been calculated for BB company. Receivables days 58, inventory turnover 10 times per year, payables days 45, non current asset days 36. What is the cash operating cycle? So you come and say question number 41. It's talking about cash operating cycle. Cash operating cycle. Cash operating cycle. So there you go. You start by saying receivables days. Receivables days. Those were what we are referring to as turnover period. 58. So these are days, not money days and then we have got inventory 10 off now inventory turnover is 10 times per annum remember when they are giving you as 10 times these are not days they are saying we are buying inventory we are replenishing it 10 times per annum so in other words out of a year of 365 it is happening 10 times meaning meaning after every 36,5 days. So you say inventory days, inventory and over period. You have to put it in days. So it will be 36, a year has got 365 and you are turning it over 10 times. You are turning it over after 36,5 days. And then you say less payables days. Payables. Payables days. You know, payables days in this case is 45. Minus 45. The answer you get becomes the cash operating cycle. 49,5. That's your cash operating cycle. So the answers in red and bold are the required answers. Like this. This is question 41. Question 41. Then let us go to question 42. It says DC decides to offer 2% early settlement discount that half of the customers take up. They pay in one month instead of two. DC pays 10% per annum on its overdraft facility. What impact, impact will this have? If you, if you give discount, cash operating cycle reduces because customers are now paying you early. So your cash operating cycle reduces. Profits, they reduce also because discount allowed is an expense. So 42C. This one is C. Then 43. 43. 
you know, WW companies, a current ratio of two, receivables are three, and current liabilities are two. What are the inventory days if cost of sales is 10 million per annum? And WW company is a zero cash balance. Assume 365 days in a year. So they are saying it is zero cash balance. So the only assets are receivables and inventory. And liability is two. Current liabilities are two. So we are we are given so under the second when you are doing such questions you you say receivables receivables we are told that receivables are three so you put three there then inventory you are not given inventory put x there. Uh, put X there and then you now have receivables 3 and then so you have to current assets oh sorry you now have current assets current assets equals 3 plus x, 3 plus x, that's your current assets. And then current liabilities, current liabilities, current liabilities, you are told it's 2. And current ratio, current ratio is also two so what you do is you are now saying therefore then we are now saying two two equals current assets over current liabilities which is three equals open bracket three plus x over two so you get what you then get here is inventory, inventory equals to x equals. So it's like you multiply both sides by 2. So it's 4 equals 3 plus x. So inventory becomes 1. Right. So they are saying cost of sales were how much? Cost of sales were 10 million. So you now say inventory days. Inventory days. Inventory days equals 1 million over 10 cost of sales times 365, which is 36,5 days. Simple as that. Remember, inventory days, you get it by saying inventory over cost of sales times 365. So 1 million over 10, 10 multiplied by 365. That's inventory days. Next, question number 44. Question number 44 says, Wallace is annual credit sales of 4,500,000. And on average, customers take 60 days to pay, assuming 360 days in a year. As a result, Wallace is trade receivable balance of 450 of 750. The company relies on overdraft finance and at an annual interest rate of 10%. You know, that's what I said. When you are selling on credit, it means you are being charged because you are, you are getting finance elsewhere. And interest is 10%. And then Wallace is considering offering an early settlement discount of 1% for 
for payment in 30 days. It is expected that 25% of customers, which is 35% which is of annual credit sales figure. So remember, when we are dealing with discount, we are talking of credit sales figure. So we use 35%. We ignore 25%, but use 35%. We'll pay in 30 days in order to obtain the discount. Now there's need for English there. If the question says 35% of customers will pay in 30 days in order to obtain a discount, it means 65% will stick to the current policy. They will not change. If they say 35% will change, it means 65% will not. That's what it means. What if, what if, if Wallace introduces the, dis, the proposed di discount, what will be the net impact? So I, I gave you procedure here. I said, yes, the procedure. You calculate receivables under old policy. Yes. Yeah. Calculate receivables under old policy, receivables under new policy, to see if there was a decrease or increase. And if there was a decrease, you then calculate savings in financing cost, which is R percent times the decrease. And then compare the savings to other costs like discount allowed to see if there's a net benefit or a net cost. So I want you to follow through, like you say, receivables under old policy. Receivables under current policy. The current is what we are referring to as old. Because we want to change it. That's the policy that is always there. Receivables under current policy. We are told that receivables under current policy are 750,000. So you put 750 here. Then receivables under the new policy. Receivables under new policy. Receivables under the new policy. We want to calculate this. So receivables under the new policy is like this. There are customers who will take discount and pay within 30 days. So they are discount customers. Discount cost. This will be 30 over 360. They are saying AA is 360 times 4,500. Credit sales are 4,500. You know, credit sales are four five hundred, four million five hundred, and these customers who will take the discount are thirty five percent. So you say times thirty five percent. You close brackets like this. You don't rush when you are answering this. You take it easy. So you say equals thirty over three sixty times four five hundred times 35%. One thirty one two fifty. That's the new policy. And there are customers who don't change, which we call non-discount customers. Non-discount customers. Sticking to the old policy. Remain remain with old policy non-discount customers remaining with old policy so this will be 65 percent so it will be like 65 percent times times four five hundred one two three so you say equals sixty over three sixty times 
times 65%. So the new receivables, new receivables are equals this plus this. These are the new receivables, 618,750. So receivables under old police, 750. Under new police, 618,750. So what it therefore mean is there is a decrease in receivables. There is a decrease in receivables. There is a decrease in receivables which is equal to 750 minus 618. So receivables decrease by 131,250. Now, what it means is we were getting funds, we are, we are getting overdrafted 10%. What it means, we were being charged 10% of 750. We are now being charged 10% of 618. So we save, it's not like we save 131, no. We save 10% of 131. So you then say cost and benefits. Cost and benefits. In the exam, I want you to do it this way, unless if it's multiple choice where you can change. So you are now save, saving in receivables, financing cost, savings in receivables, financing, savings in receivables, financing cost. You are now saying 10% multiplied by 131, 250. So saving it equals 0.1 times this. That's the saving. And then what is cost you to save is the fact that there is a discount allowed. And discount allowed is being taken up by 35% of customers. So you say less, less discount allowed less discount allowed discount allowed 35 percent of customers are taking up the discount which is 35 percent times four million five hundred one two three times one percent remember the discount rate is one percent so you're now saying equals minus 0.35 times 4,500, 1, 2, 3, times 0 0.01. So there's a discount allowed of this amount. We want to find if there's a net cost or a net benefit. And clearly, here there's a net cost. So you say net cost. So there's a net cost of 62625. This is the net cost. So the answer is 2625 cost, which is D. Continuing. MM Kanban sells inventory on credit for a profit. All else being equal, what will happen to the quick and acid test and current ratio after this sale? So what you need to do when answering these questions, don't rush. You are selling inventory at a profit. So it's like, let's say, let's say you have got receivables. And, oh, this is now number 45, sorry. Let's say all you have here is receivables and inventory. Inventory, inventory and pebbles. I mean, let's say, so, so we have current assets, 
current assets and then we have got current liabilities you don't just rush in answering this let's say your current your invent your receivables are 10 inventory is 10 current assets it's 20 current liabilities it's 10 and then we have under the under this under this framework here under the current terms we have got current ratio current ratio it's 2 then quick ratio quick ratio quick quick ratio quick ratio remember it's current assets minus inventory over current liabilities so quick ratio is 1 now let's say let's say we sell inventory at a profit of $2 let's say let's let's say let's sell uh, inventory on credit at a profit of two dollars let's say we are selling inventory on credit at a profit of two dollars Remember current current as current ratio you get it by saying 20 over current assets over current liabilities. Quick ratio you say equals current assets. You actually say equals open bracket current assets minus inventory over current liabilities. No wonder why quick ratio is 1. And this one is the sum of current assets, inventory plus receivables. Now, let's say you sell inventory at a profit of $2. So the new position will be like this. The new position will be like this. Copy and paste. You have sold inventory at a profit of $2. So inventory, on inventory, there will be nothing. There will be zero because you have, you have sold all the inventory. But remember, it was on credit at a profit of two dollars. So receivables will now increase by twelve. So receivables becomes equals ten plus inventory sold at a uh, at a profit of two dollars, twelve. So you do notice un under this that current ratio becomes two comma two, quick ratio becomes two comma two. So the answer then is both both current and quick ratio will increase. You know, that's how you do when you're answering these questions. You don't just have to look and close your eyes and say, oh, okay, we sell at a profit, so that will be... You know, this will make a difference between the one who gets 48% and the one who gets 50 And it is called laziness. It, it, for these two marks, it will be called lazy because you, you can't really tell what will happen by merely looking and closing your eyes and say, okay, so this will, so this will. Uh, that's not possible. Why can't you just come up with just rough figures and verify what will happen? You, you end your marks nicely like that and like a situation where you lose max so easily so both current and quick ratio as you can see they have increased question number 46 question number 46 says ts company daily demand for bearings is 40 remember this is daily not annually so you have to multiply by the number of days. Is 40 a day for each of the 250 days in a year? 
So if you want to find the annual demand, you say 250 by 40. That's annual demand. The bearings are purchased from a local supplier for $2 each. The cost of placing an order is 64. And the inventory costs, I mean inventory holding costs expressed as a percentage of inventory purchase price is 25%. What is economic order quantity? So it's a matter of saying annual demand, annual demand, annual demand, it's 40 times 250, 40 times 250, that's annual demand there. So which is equals to, equals 40 times 250, and then, that's 10,000. Then EOQ. Remember, we have got EOQ. So there you go. Square root of annual demand times. So I can still work it here and say equals square root. You know, I have got square root feature here. Like square root. SQRT. Square root of 2 times annual demand, 10,000, times ordering costs, 64, divided by, divided by, holding cost, they are saying it's 25% of purchase price, which is 25% of $2, that's 50 cents, 0, 0,5, 0, enter. So economic order quantity becomes 1,600. That's economic order quantity. On question number 46. Question number 47. Question number 47. EE -E companies calculated the following in relation to its inventories. So what are the total inventory related costs? Now in this question, in this question, we are called, we are told buffer inventory, 50 units, reorder size. Now when they say reorder size, they are already telling you about economic order quantity. Remember, if you are asked to define economic order quantity, economic order quantity, it is the size of an order which minimizes costs. So if they say reorder size, they've already told you the, the, the size of the order. So there's no need to calculate EOQ. Ordering costs $50. Ordering cost $1.25. Annual demand $10,000. Purchase price two. What are the total inventory related costs for the year to the nearest whole number? If they say total, you now say Purchase price, purchase cost. Remember, purchase cost is part of total cost. Purchase cost. You simply say annual demand times purchase price. Annual demand times purchase price. That's purchase cost. And you, you, you get it as what? Which is equals to 10,000 times uh, what is the purchase price? $2, 10,000 times $2, that's 20,000. And then you say total ordering costs, TOC, total ordering costs, you said annual demand over EOQ times cost per order. Annual demand is 10,000. Order size, which is EOQ, is 250 times cost per order, which is $50. Here, yeah. we are told that annual demand is 10,000. Order size 250. Order cost $50. So you then say equals 10, 1, 2, 3, over 250 times 50. And then you say 
total holding cost THC. The formula says buffer plus EOQ over 2 times CH. So which is equals to, do we have buffer? You come here and say buffer, yes, it's there, 50. So buffer is 50 plus EOQ, which is order size, 250 over 2 close brackets and then you multiply this by holding costs which is dollar twenty five dollar twenty five the holding cost there is dollar twenty five so in the bracket what you get in the bracket becomes what you get in the bracket becomes one twenty five plus fifty which is equals you can actually do it like say fifty plus two fifty over two it works out times 1,25, $1.25. So you get 218,75. Then you add this. What you get is called total inventory related costs. They are saying to the nearest to all number. So it's important because this is computer based. If you get it with a comma like this, and the examiner says to the nearest one number and you type it with a comma, you get it wrong. So you have to put it to the nearest one number, which is 22219. So this becomes total inventory related costs. Now, this point which I have just mentioned, it's so important. When the examiner says to the nearest one number and you don't, remember this is computer based, it is being marked by the stencil on by the machine. So the, the machine doesn't know whether you had you had it closed. No. You get it. So there you go. Which, which of the following is not a benefit of just-in-time approach? Just-in-time means you are ordering st stock when there is demand for it. So we were on number 20, number 47. We are now on number 48. Which of the following is not a benefit of just-in-time approach? It's not, you know, just in time means you are ordering components when they are being on demand. It's an approach to production and purchasing. Where production is initiated or components are ordered when there is demand. That's just in time. So just in time, just in time, it requires you to have close the relationship with suppliers. It requires you also, just in time, requires you also to, it requires you to, to ensure that your labor is, is multi-skilled because you wait for the customer to place an order. And also your production machine or equipment is flexible. Because in a just in time, there is no customization. I mean, there is no standardization. Rather, there is customization. You wait for the customer to place an order and you produce as per the customer specification. You don't produce in bulk in a just in time. When you are producing in bulk, we say there is a standardization. So, just in time results in lower inventory, it's a benefit. Just in time results in better product customization. It's a benefit. Because you wait for the customer to place an order. So you produce as per the customer's order. So there's better product customization. It's a benefit there. Just in time results in higher quality, yes. Because you produce as per the customer's order. So the chances are the goods will be fit for the purpose. In other words, there will be quality. But just in time does not result in easy of product of production scheduling. You don't schedule production easily in a just in time environment because the orders 
you wait for the customer to place an order before you can schedule your production. So there's no easiness with production scheduling. You get that? So you come here and say, the answer is C. It's not a benefit of just in time. There's no production scheduling. Right? Question number 49. Notice how I would love to finish these questions. You know, I love to finish these questions. So after I'm done, make sure you do all questions to the end. XYZ company's annual credit sales of 20 million. Accounts receivables of 4 million. Working capital is financed by an overdraft. 12% interest per year. Assume 365 days in a year. What is the annual financing effect if management reduces credit collection period from 60 days by offering an early settlement discount of 1% that all customers adopt? So this one is easy. You All you simply do is, I said, you say current receivables under the current policy receivables under the current policy this is what you always do whenever there's a change receivables under the current policy are four million so you you come here and type four million four one two three one two three and then receivables under the new policy receivables under new policy under the new policy we are being told that under the new policy they are paying now in 60 days so and they are saying how many days in a year 365 it's 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 important to know that the examiner has said how many days in a year 60 over 365 times 20 million those are 20 million so you get what? Receivables under the new policy equals 60 over 365 times 20, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So this, these are receivables under the new policy. And then, okay, you can put commas for, for figures to make sense there. Then you need to check was there a decrease in receivables, which is equals to 4 million minus the new so there was a decrease in receivables after getting decrease in receivables you then say you then say costs and benefits costs and benefits remember you now want to evaluate so you say savings savings in receivables financing cost our, we are we are we are having 12 percent times so it's 12 percent times 7 12 328 comma 77 so we are saying equals this multiply by 0.12 that's a saving and then what has caused us to have this saving is that we offer the discount of 1%, which all customers adopt. So 1% of 20 million, because everyone adopted it. So you say less. You now understand this. Discount allowed. Discount allowed. It's now, it's, it's 20 million times 1%. 20 million. 1%. So this is a cost equals minus 20, 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 times 0 0.01. Then you check whether there was a net benefit or a net cost from the decision that we make. So here it's a net cost. Net cost of 114. 520,55. 520, 
That's a net cost. So the answer there on question number is B. 114, 520, or it's 114, 521, because it's comma 55, so it makes sense. Question number 50. Question number 50. We just want to take it up to somewhere where I feel we have answered all the questions. Which of the following are services provided by a dead factor? What are, what, which, of the, which of these are services provided by a dead factor? So, bad debt insurance is, the, is correct. Advancing credit is correct. Receivables ledger management, correct. Management of debt collection process, correct. So, all of the above. All. Are correct or are correct on question number 50. Then question number 51. As you say, I am keen to revise as many questions as possible, but I don't have an exam. I, 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 I could have even, I could have even said, let's, let, let, can you just do it and revise but notice but unfortunately when i end you also end i don't know why so we want to get say to number 55 and we'll be done which of the following least likely used in receivables ledger management i mean in the management of foreign receivables now man management of foreign receivables means these are in foreign countries management of foreign receivables these are receivables in a foreign country as the name suggests management of foreign receivables how you go about it when you are managing foreign receivables there are, there are quite various methods you can use what is called one counter trade on credit Counter trade on credit, meaning the customer where you sold your goods on credit, you also buy from that customer on credit. In so doing, you are managing your foreign receivables. Number two, you can use what is called um, export credit insurance. You can use export credit insurance foreign receivables. You can take insurance containing export receivables or foreign receivables. You can also use foreign receivables debt factoring. Foreign receivables factoring. Also possible to factor out your foreign receivables. You can also use what is called letter of credit letter of credit you, you remember letter of credit meaning obtaining a guarantee to pay from customers bank obtaining a guarantee a guarantee to pay from a customers from a foreign customers bank foreign customers bank that is called letter of credit where you obtain a guarantee you ask your customer to go to its bank and get a guarantee that the bank will pay not the customer we call that letter of credit another way is you can actually use what is called bill of exchange exchange variant of Variant of it is a, meaning obtain a promise to pay. Obtain a promise to pay. A promise to pay at a specified date. Specified date. A date 
from the foreign customer foreign customer actually letter of credit is also known as invoice discounting this one also known as invoice discounting also known as invoice discounting we discussed the letter of credit last week if you play the video on sources of finance that's where we discussed this at length when we were doing money market, capital, money market securities. That's where we discussed a letter of credit. So these are ways of managing foreign accounts receivables. Now the question is, which one is least likely, meaning is not? Uh, it's commercial paper. A commercial paper is not a way of managing receivables but rather it's a it's a it's a it's an instrument issued by a company when it wants to raise finance on a money market and this finance is to be repaid in less than a year that's a commercial paper it's a coupon bearing instrument it has nothing to do with receivables management so the, the answer is commercial paper commercial paper so commercial paper has nothing to do with receivables management. You get that? Then uh, now if I get to 52, I'm sure I'll be done. I'll be done on 52. I then leave it up to you guys to, to do all the remaining questions. 52. Oh, sorry. Now, 52 is saying, L is considering whether to factor its sales invoices. A factor is offered L a non-recourse package. Now, if, if you are offered the non-recourse, it means you are no longer responsible or you, do, you are no longer exposed to the risk of bad debts. A factor is offered L a non-recourse package at a cost of 1.5%. And sales and admin of sales and admin fee is 6,000 per annum. Bed debts are currently 2% of sales per annum and sales are 1.5 million. What is the cost of the package? So like this. So we are saying with a non-recourse factoring, let me repeat this. With a non-recourse factoring, you still remember, we once wrote this point, with a non-recourse factoring, this one, with a non-recourse factoring, the firm will no longer be exposed to the risk of bad debts. This is a very important point. With a non-recourse factoring, the firm is no longer exposed to the risk of bad debts. So you now say, an admin fee, 6,000. 